record and see what happens. Sweet. Yeah. I think it's recording. All right. Cool. Thank you. So this is episode 13 of what we're calling uh, both laughs, the dying scene, quarantine. I don't know. I've had like eight different names and it's 13 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but thank you both for coming on. This is really cool. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, dude. This is uh, normally when I talk to people that are promote, put out new music, I sort of start with congratulations on putting out new music. But I think there's something cooler to congratulate you on because you're Kaylin, a action figure now. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I kind of lost it when I found that out. Um, but yeah. I kind of lost thank, it when I saw it. I did too. Awesome. It's sick. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was super cool. Because um, yeah. I've known Nick, the guy who does them. I've known him for yeah. a little while now. We we both grew up in New Hampshire. We're the same age. We grew up like ten minutes from each other. I didn't meet him till like two years ago. <laughs> That's hilarious. He's That's he's cool. in he's in a band uh, called Donaher that was opening for Smoking Popes and the Atari. Oh, nice. So uh -huh. I just, and it was sort of funny. Like I literally grew up ten minutes away from him and. We had never met before. I didn't realize he was doing this toy thing till very recently. And then he put the tiny stills one up. I was like, holy shit. All of my world just come out like right there. That's and, awesome. So yeah, I, I also am I'm newly acquainted uh, with Nick, but the my favorite thing that I told him that he did with the toy was, so there's, actually, I don't know if I told him, I think I told everyone else except for him, but he <laughs> quoted the, the new song, uh, our new single Craigslist bed on the side of the toy with the, the lyrics. Um, every day is a new disappointment. Every night is a brand new low. And then up top it says, don't look too close. And I'm like, I'm a depressed action figure. This is the shit. I was like, someone, everyone can look up to. This is great. You know, I'm everybody. <laughs> that's what everyone needs. Seriously. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be one of the coolest things. Like he it was, was just, funny. He was just on, there's this little news program in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm originally from there. I live in Massachusetts now, mm -hmm. as I was just telling Chris, but there's a show called Chronicle that's on like oh, yeah. TV. Fritz. And he's just on New Hampshire Chronicle talking about like his whole uh, business thing, like how the action figure thing started. It's wild, but it's really cool. That's awesome. That's sick. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah he's, I awesome. Thought... he's like okay. a stand up comic too, I think. So. Oh, really? He's just, he's just like a unique okay. dude. Yeah. Doing it all. That's Very cool. cool. Uh, and Chris, you grew up in New Hampshire as well. I did. I did. I grew up in New Hampshire in Port, like right outside of Portsmouth in Summersworth. And, uh, home of the uh, Hilltoppers, right? Is home that... of the Hilltoppers, man. You know your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Home of the Hilltoppers. It's like a blue cat that is yeah. weird. Yeah. I don't even know if it exists. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I grew up there. I moved to LA like six years ago, five years ago now. Five years ago, I think this year. What brought you to LA? The music thing? Or? Playing music, man. Yeah, I really wanted to play. I really wanted to tour and I uh, got, got some opportunities to, uh, you know, do some touring out there. And so uh, I took them and then I loved it so, so much that I just I came back, packed up all my stuff and moved, you know. You mean you couldn't make it in the New Hampshire music scene? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I, yeah, I don't want to play jazz brunch, you know, so I'm out. It's not like that's all you got. You know? <laughs> I was just telling uh, somebody else the other day that New Hampshire, when I, I'm like 40, so the New Hampshire music scene when I was there was literally nothing. It, yeah. Like the Bruisers, maybe. Oh, yeah, dude. I love the Bruisers. But otherwise, like Gigi Allen was born in New Hampshire yeah. and Mandy Moore was born in New Hampshire. And that's, yeah. that's yeah. literally like the Wikipedia. That's what you got. That's what you got. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, it can be a little dismal. It is a beautiful place. It's absolutely sure. wonderful. I'm enjoying it right now, but it is uh, Live free or die. Not, not, yeah, not the place to be <laughs> if you're trying to be a career musician, unfortunately. Yeah. You know? They all leave. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but otherwise, congratulations on Craigslist bed. Uh, I think that has already become like the catchiest song either of the summer or the year, probably. But, wow. Uh, wow. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks yeah Did, was that written during quarantine or was that from before or what's sort of the timeline there so i had a little bit of a i had a demo for that one that i brought to chris um and we kind of started pre-production on that do we start that in january chris? december 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 yeah because oh, we record Lord. we laid it down in january okay so yeah so that that was started in like late 2019 so that one 
we don't have any songs coming out that were written in quarantine because we've kind of been, you know, far away from each other. But we, we did record this in January with the original intent of releasing an EP before our spring tour, which then, you know, got delayed and then right. canceled and then rescheduled, you know. Um, so we've been sitting on these for a little bit. Um, we have a song coming out every month is the goal. Until oh. we get back to touring, we're going to keep releasing a new song every month. Um, and then the first three will be from the CP that we recorded in January. And then in theory, we're going to record some more um, in the next two months in a way that's safe. You know, find a way to do it. I was going to say, yeah. if you're going to do it uh, and release them every month before until you can tour again. So like eight, like a double album. <laughs> yeah. God, yeah. I, who knows? Songs. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We'll get a booklet too. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Earth Rancid album, just 29 songs. <laughs> yes. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yes. Totally. Um, but yeah, it's been a weird, obviously like a weird year for music, but um, we do have a tour currently scheduled for January of 2021. I'm hopeful, but at the same time, I, I don't really know. I mean, I don't think any of us know what's going to happen in 2021. So it's it's not currently announced. We don't have the dates published anywhere because we're kind of all just waiting and we're hoping and crossing our fingers that that's going to actually work out i we, we, we really want it to so what do you think will will be the point that we get to where people start to feel comfortable re actually releasing those tour dates because everybody has either pushed things to like october of 2021 or right. says let's see but what do you think the point will be where we get comfortable like what's it going to take or is that a thing that even factors in Oof, man I don't know. I, I think it's going to take a lot of, uh, I'd be well into the fall, winter, I imagine, maybe January, just January, I would imagine, just like top of the year, announce all the dates for the year and see what happens. But I don't know. It's going to be wild. It's going to be a wild uh, six months to get to that point. And yeah, I, we're only six months out. When you think uh, about where we yeah. were six months ago, the whole world's different. Yeah. You know, and that's, we've found a new normal we're trying to live with now, but it really, you see how quickly things change. So it's so hard to say one way or the other, you know, but I don't know. I don't think, I don't think we would feel safe doing anything right now for sure. Given the current state of things. I mean, Los Angeles is a hotbed and people are sick and it's, they're talking about right now, as of today, even doing Chris, I don't know if you heard about this, but doing a, a second. second shelter in place. Yeah. Really? So yeah. Cause it's that bad here. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Second shelter in place. Like let's, Let's see what happens now. So it's it seems like the Wild West right now. I don't know. What, what are conditions in LA right now? And we, I mean, we went through, we were kind of in the early first wave where it got really bad. Like, yeah. this is, I think, is still third overall in the state in total deaths and total cases. So okay. we went through it really bad at the beginning. But I think we're one of only four states now where things are actually pretty good. Uh, knock on wood, because, nice. you know, uh, but what's LA like now? What's the, what's lockdown like and what's the sort of quality of life there now? Have you ever seen the movie Mad Max? <laughs> <laughs> I watched it last night. <laughs> I mean, I don't leave my, this place that you see behind me is the little tiny guest house that I live in, which is actually a converted garage with like a hot plate. This is where I live and I haven't left. Like, I haven't left. Wow. Like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. And it's yeah. because it's, I mean, I've gone for um, one, I went for a hike where I saw no one, you know what I mean? But it's like, yeah. this is the new reality. I get food delivered. I get groceries delivered from like mm -hmm. Amazon Fresh or Ralph's, but I couldn't really tell you. I did have to go to a doctor's appointment. Um, I saw some, half the people I saw weren't wearing masks, half were. Yeah, and yeah. that was even going to a doctor's appointment. So that's kind of like the, yeah. I didn't want to deal with it. Right, Chris. That's what you've seen. Yeah, right? everything's closed. All your favorite restaurants, stores, venues, everything probably aren't going to reopen. You know, I like know. a miracle. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just everything that's dead. I mean, that might be different now. I, I kind of had to come home for some family stuff for a little while. That might be different as of like a week ago. But uh, you know, yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Uh, definitely worse than definitely worse than here for sure. Yeah. I don't think a lot of the places, Chris, that like I don't know about you but or or you either it's like a lot of the places I like to go for, for like food or takeout or anything like that 
are definitely struggling and I just feel like they're not going to open again. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I feel like my one. favorite, yeah. Like some of our favorite venues even are being yeah. sold as we speak, um, changing ownership. So who knows with that, but, and like everything that's going on with like Niva, they're trying to get funding to help support small venues. And I don't, I don't know the current state of that, but that's an, a whole nother issue compared to even what, LA is going to look like once it reopens because nothing that I think I knew about 2019 LA is going to be the same as 2021 LA. Like all of the favorite restaurants or things that I liked about living here. It's like, no, I feel like we're going to be starting over in a lot of ways. It's oh, like definitely. that, uh, the yeah. unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Did you ever watch where she's Hell yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't. So and, oh, oh, that show is yeah. hell yeah. <laughs> that show was awesome. <laughs> Uh, but she she lived in a bunker. She was kidnapped by a religious cult. It's a whole it's, <laughs> it's like a big thing, yeah. Uh, it's a thing. She, she spent like seven years in a bunker, and then because they thought it was the end of the world, they thought they were it inside the mm -hmm. bunker. And then they finally open the bunker when they get saved, and it's like, oh my god, there's a <laughs> world out here. Yeah, yeah. Like so it feels like that. It definitely feels that way. We've lost one legitimate venue so far uh, in Boston. Oh. Great, great Scott. Great Scott. Scott yeah. not coming back. Yeah. Love that venue. Yeah. That was a big deal. It's really weird to envision Austin, Brighton, Boston itself without Great Scott. Because yeah. there's quite literally no other 200, 250 capacity venue around, which no. is weird to say for a city like Boston with the sort of music history it has. That's the only room that was like that. Yeah. Well, I remember it was TT the Bears similar closed. And that's closed. close but like i feel like that was maybe close to dt's i think is it smaller it was smaller yeah it was maybe yeah. 80 or 100 something like mm -hmm. that okay uh, so just a little but i feel like yeah things yeah, like are upstairs changing at middle much. east is sort of like upstairs at middle east I yes think, yeah but, but we we don't play middle east I was anymore. Say, we, we don't support the middle east yeah uh -huh. that's Which, but... that broke my heart truthfully <laughs> as i grew up yeah. at the middle east i from the time I was in a senior in high school, of course, it shows at the Middle East, and mm -hmm. practically lived there in college. And so, for what has happened to that place, quite literally broke my heart. It's like, how do I not go back there? You know, but I know. That, that's another episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's another episode. <laughs> uh, how has writing music been during quarantine? If you have stuff that you want to work on, hopefully three months from now, how has are you able to even process all of what's going on now? musically or are you not going to try because i've heard people have sort of conflicting opinions on that um i i put out like a, a solo song that i just did by myself because i wanted to get it out um but Getting in the apocalypse well it's, just, yeah it's, uh, which is another cool song <laughs> thank, you like you. Tiny but, like that song. thank you so much um but that song it was like one of those moments like time capsule moments where it was like i just feel like I need to do something completely on my own. It, it's not anything like Tiny Stills. It's just electronic music, you know? And like, I felt like that really s felt too, like the way collaborating feels. It feels a little, I mean, you think of the postal service or like how some of those original, like long distance um, collaborations happen. But I was like, this is just going to be all digital, almost no real instruments, just me. Um, because it feels very isolating for me to write that way. But like, We'll, we're going to get to the point with tiny stills where we'll be sending stuff back and forth to each other, especially if this is the new normal. Um, because the only thing I could right now bring myself to write in quarantine was a song about how I felt like the world was falling apart and was disappointing politically, emotionally, and romantically and uh, fuck everything. And so I released dating in the apocalypse because I was like, this is how I feel right now. And um, it's been hard to focus on anything else. So in terms of writing with Tiny Stills, some other things we might want to talk about in future songs, because for me, like, I want to say something first and foremost, whenever I sit down to write, everything I'm writing is like, very sad. Um, <clears throat> and just kind of like angry. So I'm, I have little tidbits of things that I'm going to bring to Chris and kind of be like, hey, what do you think? Um, but that hasn't happened yet, because it's not a fully formed idea. I've been feeling really shitty. Yeah, that's, you know. that's valid. <laughs> yeah, like, like it's think weird how, to not. What did you say? Sorry. It's weird to not feel shitty now, truthfully. Yeah, I mean, definitely. like, how does any, 
I don't know about you guys, but like, I can't focus on things. I, ha- I try yeah. really hard to like, cause I, I have the ability to work remotely, which is I'm grateful for, but I can't focus on stuff. I feel, I get distracted by everything that even the news cycles. And I, I stay up till four in the morning these days. I can't sleep till four. And then I'm forcing myself to wake up before noon. Cause I, I'm like, I gotta feel like a normal person. Um, but it's been really hard to focus on anything creative except for that one song that I just cranked out tunnel vision, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I have been mostly working remotely. I got to go into the office today, which is right in downtown Boston, like right in the financial Mm -hmm. district and to be in the financial district of Boston, which is during the week is a hop hopping place. Usually it's a ghost town still, which I guess is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It means parking and traffic were awesome. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So the bright side, but it made me feel a little bit like a human because I didn't have to work on my couch and Mm -hmm. I could actually pretend that I was working all day. It was really, it probably did a lot for me mentally that I uh, am only now figuring out. I, I can see why that would be the case. I mean, I feel like I've lost track of time a lot in (laughs) quarantine and except for the fact that I don't really have windows um that's well, not right. helpful but yeah like i just lose track of what day it is and it kind of all blurs together i have like a 12 year old daughter who's actually right there i have a 12 year old daughter as well and so now that school is over <laughs> what's up what up? <laughs> uh now that school is over every day is the same I, like oh, we yeah. kind of felt like groundhog day before but now <laughs> yeah. school is over like, yeah. there are no there's no such thing as days it's, no. no. Yeah. And there's not going to be for a while. Yeah. Well, Chris, you have a different experience too because you you traveled recently. You drove yeah, across the country, so you really saw. Hey, how was that? Holy Everything. shit! It was brutal. It was wild. So like my my wife is uh, like been awesome with like sanitizing everything we've been doing masks we only wore masks once and then washed them like we were like really really on our game and um i had to come home and help with some family stuff that was going on so we said let's drive like we don't want to fly because of just how crazy it is you know and um and she never really done a road trip so we went all across like the northern like uh midwest kind of states and it was wild uh we were stared at, looked at, given dirty looks. We're for wearing masks, uh, really, all over the place. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, there was there were. If you'd gone into, you know, I won't name any particular states, but like you know, <laughs> we, don't, we don't state shame here. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was like nothing had happened. It was like really? like business as usual. Bars open, no masks. Stores open, no masks. Uh, you name it you know business as usual yeah Uh, it was crazy it was crazy very eye-opening and very scary yeah how long did it take you to drive across country we took our time we both love hiking and camping so like we we camped like through the grand tetons and then uh went to like a lake house in montana where we hung out for a little while so we did like two weeks and we like really took our time um you know like uh hiked the badlands and backpacked in the badlands a little bit and so like it was it was really really fun um and like seemed to be the only like valid social disting activity <laughs> that we could do <laughs> like you know like go be in the woods for two days and not see a single person <laughs> you know I was like, all right cool <laughs> yeah but uh it was it was crazy it was it was really eye-opening it's very eye-opening yeah yeah that's wild and it maybe is a good experience to have had if you are able to make it through it and not get sick because nobody yeah. else can nap. Uh, but maybe that's a good thing to have lived through a sort of perspective. Yeah, it was wild. It was wild. So now we're here and doing all the same <laughs> kind of uh, kind of uh, endeavors that uh, we were doing in LA. So staying safe. You know? Are you going to try to drive back when the time comes? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to take off pretty soon, actually, and uh, just get back. But I think we're going to go, like, quick back. We're just going to, like, bang it out in three days, like, just get back home, you know. You don't want to be in town for the president this weekend? The president. Uh, you know what's, you know what's like, ultra fucked up is it's my goddamn anniversary on Saturday, oh, no. and I wanted to take my wife to the, a restaurant, like, right in Portsmouth. Yeah, and, and I was like, I just got to wait till Saturday. I mean, till Sunday. Like, I have to wait. I have to push it a day because, like, I'm not going to fucking try to eat with all that 
crap around. <laughs> Mind you, they have a mask mandate in Portsmouth, and they're re they're re um, rescinding the mask restriction for the rally for Saturday. For Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're not gonna, you can't write this shit. You really, can't write no. this shit. Like, like the the mayor himself, I I because I'm sort of like I work uh, I work for a hospital, but so I cover like a lot of ground in the northeast. So I read all the local papers every morning. And yeah, the mayor himself was like, Yeah, we're not really gonna push the mask restriction, even though there is one. I'm like uh well I'll be wearing one for sure, and we're eating outside yeah. on a deck above the ocean. So that's what I'll be doing. New Hampshire was one of the states making progress, and two weeks from now, that's for sure. Be. Yeah, it's not going to be the case. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're like the, my parents said they're in like phase six already. Like New Hampshire is, like we're real close. Something Every like state that. has know. has its own phases. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're in phase three, but there's like three parts of phase three, and that's yeah. Phase. And phase four doesn't start until there's a vaccine. So we're oh, just kind of we're, we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. God. Um, so you're kind of the new guy to the group, Chris. How did how did you get involved in the Tiny Stills uh, circle? Yeah, so um, uh, we have a mutual friend named Mike Peppy, who's just a sweet boy. Hi, Mike. <laughs> He's a sweet boy. We <laughs> love him very, very much. Yeah. Uh, he is such an incredibly talented producer and stuff. Definitely check out his shit. But um yeah, we, we kind of just got connected through him, you know, it was very much like a, uh, started out as like a, Hey, I need, you know, we need a bass player for a couple of gigs. And then we kind of just kept talking and, you know, I didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it went. He's just lives right here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. That's how the virtual background's yeah. on. Everything yeah, he's I've actually right here. <laughs> uh yeah I mean, it just uh, yeah it's pretty yeah. effortless pretty uh not it's overthought no or anything yeah yeah when did right. you come into the fold so obviously it was for recording this back in december january somewhere around there yeah it was about like december i think we went out to phoenix right and we played a, a mm -hmm. couple of gigs in phoenix and uh yeah so december yeah was like really when and then we kind of got serious uh in the studio in january and then we we're supposed to go out, obviously, a bunch, you know, this past spring and summer, but, uh, you know, that got pushed. So now we're just, we're grinding it out. We're just trying to prepare right now, right, for uh, when it all hits in supposed January. So, um, yeah, it was pretty easy and wonderful. And we're having so much fun. At least I'm having so much fun. I assume. <laughs> Your bandmates that are pretty far away. Well, here's the thing about Chris that you need to know about Chris is like we did one short short tour together and after that I was like I love you like <laughs> tour together forever which is a very rare thing to say to people so it's like fast been on tour yeah because yeah. yeah. you typically learn to hate people right. uh, pretty quickly right uh, but it was great and we just really clicked and it just happened to be like at a point where in tiny stills is you know, story that we, we do want to find a drummer that we get to play with a lot more. And we'd love to find another guitar player that we play with really consistently um, on the West Coast, you know, and like, <laughs> it's, it's been, because we have friends all over and that Everywhere. we play yeah, yeah. with and, and it just, the scheduling hasn't worked out. And like, obviously we live in different places. So it's been really crazy trying to find people who want to do a band full time the way like we really want to. And um, it just really clicked with Chris after that tour. We slept on floors and it was great. Slept on floors. The Prius broke down. I mean, it happened. We did it in a Prius. We did. We <laughs> ear shared. We drove in a Prius. Yeah. Did it break down? Oh, it did. Yeah, it, it did. Dark. It did. It did. We you got sick. Before. Like, it was brutal couple of yeah. days. <laughs> we had to go to urgent care. Yeah. <laughs> the Prius wouldn't start. It was a full tour. I mean, I feel like if yeah. you don't go to urgent care and your car doesn't start, it's not a real right. tour. But we exactly. really got the full experience. And you didn't hate each other after that, so it must be legit. It was so much fun. Oh, my God. We laughed, like, the entire yeah. three days that we were out there for. Oh, my God. We had a really good time. So Yeah. yeah. I have a buddy who's in a band with his kid and he says, uh, oh. say what you will about father and son relationship. Uh, it goes out the window when you're in a band 
Oh, definitely. <laughs> it must, right? <laughs> like a, it has to. They've toured in like a pickup truck and shit like that. It, like yeah. all your stuff in the cab of a pickup truck and just just hate each other while they're on the road. <laughs> and, then, and then they come back and they father and said, but they work together too. They have like a painting business. So oh, wow. Wow. All the time. And it works together when they're painting. And then when they're on the road, it's, you know, he's just a bandmate. He's not my son. He's a bandmate. And he's usually an actor. <laughs> you, gotta, yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Whatever makes it work. Chris is just unfortunately the most agreeable person in the world. Like he really is a joy to be around all the time. It's like, I can't thing. say that. What'd you say? It's a New Hampshire thing. It is. Yeah, it I must think so. <laughs> it must, it must, <laughs> must be. be a New Hampshire thing. <laughs> well, you know, Daniel from the band Rebuilder. Uh -huh. is, he's a New Hampshire boy too. And he's probably Jeez. the sweetest person I've ever met. So what? Everywhere. Why are you guys so you nice? can't contain us. Truly. <laughs> like, <laughs> Some of the nicest people I know are from New Hampshire. I, we, I don't state shame here, but I do shout out. New <laughs> <laughs> we will not state shame, but God damn it. Do New we Hampshire, you? what's up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, there is the other side of the token in New Hampshire, too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> oh, there, there really is. <laughs> California, too, so it's okay. Yeah, everywhere. No, yeah. we're just having way too much fun, if you can't tell. We're just having way too much fun. Like, Kaylin and I always just, I don't know. I, we feel like we're just crazies. Was the Wiretap Records thing, was that going to be, like, the big, the first big tour? Because that was, what, five weeks or something like that? Four or five weeks? Yeah. Yeah, that was a long tour, and that was going to be our first really long one together. Um, but that's the one that got rescheduled for January. So, knock on wood, we're hoping that still happens. How far up until that? Uh, did it seem like it might still happen or did it like when did you realize <laughs> it wasn't going to happen? Oh, we we knew pretty quickly it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Um, we just we we hadn't announced it because, you know, as the world was slowly crashing down around us, it kind of was just this sad settling in that realization that all this work we had put into it you know, between like everyone at FEDA who helped us and Chris did a lot of work for, for it. And like, you know, uh, Michaela did graphics. Like we had a bunch of people who were helping us put this together and, you know, it, it all came together. It was a lot of like moving parts. And then to have it all kind of like just wilt like that was I think really disheartening. So we kind of didn't talk about it being canceled for a few weeks, but I think we all already, we already yeah. knew that it wasn't going to happen. We kept you know, talking each other on like, uh, like this isn't uh, yeah right yeah, yeah it seems like there was that yeah. week in march where things went from maybe we can still do them but maybe we can push them off well maybe in august well no it's never gonna happen it's exactly. like we went through we went through this whole spectrum in like a week yeah that's exactly what happened we march 17th um we started our quarantine our law our shelter in place and that was when i was kind of like this isn't going to happen because it was april planned for april right. um and then it's exactly like you said it got pushed back to august and then we were like no it's not going to happen in august either so yeah i think we started quarantine lockdown whatever the same time uh yeah. and so, but the week before is when shows were like some of them happened some of them didn't uh like i know i was supposed to go to a show i think it was march 12th it was Dave Hawes' birthday. He was going to play here in Boston, mm -hmm. and I've known him forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so they played in Brooklyn the night before and then kind of got halfway through Connecticut and went, this seems kind of sketchy. We shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. it. And that was the last thing that we've been shut down since then. That's, that sucks. I mean, I guess the last show that I saw was uh, The Wonder Years um, in – the Wonder Years and Pool Kids. Uh, oh, who else was on that show? Uh, it was a great show, but it was scary. I remember going and knowing that it was kind of on the, the brink of yeah, yeah, yeah. everything. And I was like, I don't know if I should go to this. Um, but it was a sold out show in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. I went, but I remember feeling like halfway through the show really anxious because I had a kind of a glimpse of what, like I felt like I knew things were bad. and. Yeah, I felt like I was only going to go to that show because it was Dave's birthday, and otherwise I right. was probably going to not. Yeah, I was like, maybe this isn't, but I still. Uh, we're, I want to keep track of time. Oh, we're at 35 sure? minutes, and it's going to 
cut us off at 40. We're doing pretty good. Uh, I only have like seven more hours worth of things to probably add. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it, a lot. It's good. No, I, I, uh, I like it this way. Um, so w when I started doing this little show, it started A, because our website crashed like six months ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know shit about computers. So there are people working on it that are above my pay grade. Uh, it's been six months, so who knows if it's going to come back. Uh, so I couldn't really do, like, I like to pretend I'm a writer. So I like to write stories and do interviews and can't do that anymore. And so uh, I can't take pictures at shows anymore. So right. why not sit down and talk to people? And at first we were just talking about, you know, what are you doing to stay busy during quarantine and all that. And then uh, because we're all at home all the time and on our phones all the time, we have to pay attention to things more that we never used to. Uh, how are you dealing with that part of it, with, with the Black Lives Matter piece that we've all sort of talked and maybe for myself given lip service to over the years? And now we sort of like, we have to, we can't look away from this shit anymore, but how are you dealing with that part of it? Because I feel like we've moved past quarantine part and there's way more important stuff going on right now. Which to me, like I was even like nervous about even doing these talks before. Cause like, what am I bringing to the table? I'm a bearded white guy from New Hampshire. So <laughs> I'm not really the one to be moving that conversation forward, but how are you sort of processing all of what's going on now? Well, I, I just want to say, sorry, Chris, I'm jumping in. Um, you're totally right. I feel a lot of the same things that you're feeling. I feel like as a white person, you know, it's not, it's not my story to tell and it's just my, I should just make space for other people to do what they do. So in that same sense, I think writing wise and artistically you go, what am I doing? Am I taking up space? What should I, you know, how, how can I actually contribute? And I think the ways that I've found that have been really helpful um, for me to feel like I am personally having some kind of effect on it is that I've had a lot of friends come to me in the group chats that I have from back home in Pennsylvania where they're like, I just found out that my parents or my uncle said this in a family chat, what do I do? And I'm like, just giving support to those friends who are like, yeah, yeah. I feel like I have to stand up to my family members and I'm really scared to actually tell them you can't say that stuff or you can't, it's, it's those subtly those those microaggressions and those things that you kind of go that's not my problem or that doesn't directly affect me those times where it's easy to shut it out trying to support people and also be aware of them so i can also you know do it for myself but also the friends i've seen a lot of friends reach out to me saying like, like hey i have to have these really hard conversations with my family members that i'm not close with i don't want to burn bridges and i'm like you guys this is the work like i'm like this is kind of the really important work that needs to needs to be done and it needs to be done in a way that like does not alienate them and kind of it's it's shown with love because I think a lot of what we're seeing is there is this very divisive way to go about it and it's it uses categories like like all cops are bad which yeah. that is true yeah. but you need to explain it in a way that doesn't alienate people who would otherwise agree with you because that's what I'm finding is that there are a lot of people who agree with the sentiment that good cops who stand by and do nothing are also bad cops. Also bad, right. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Which is yeah. the point. It's that whole saying of like, um, you know, to, to sit around and do nothing, you're also contributing to that, to the bad. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. And you go, yeah, we've thought that for a while, but now here is it, here's it in play in real life. Yeah, yeah. You know, and to explain that to a family member that is well-intentioned, but ignorant is a different game and like to bring back your emotions in a way that can actually cause change to happen it's a very difficult procedure <laughs> internally <laughs> to try to do that um so that's how personally i felt like trying to encourage your friends who are white who do have family members who say some problematic shit you know find ways to do it to, yeah. to like be that change to be it's it's small but it's really hard to do. It's hard. I've seen, I'm seeing people do it and like, it sucks. You don't want to cause waves. You don't want to do that. But it's, I'm really encouraged by how many f white friends I have from Pennsylvania and otherwise reaching back out to me. Cause I am really vocal about this on Facebook. Right. I have alienated a lot of people, <laughs> unfortunately, <Yeah>. unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately right. you know, like, but I don't get challenged on it the same way that I used to, because I have been so angry. Um, but now it's like, okay, you guys, 
I know your family. Yeah, yeah. I want them to be on the same side. I want them to get why it's wrong. How do we change minds? That's a different story. It, we're the ones that have to do the work. Right. You have to do the work. Black Lives Matter ultimately is a, right. it's like, we're the problem. We're, we're the, the, the problem. Yes. yes. And yes. it's angry. You know, I feel anger, you know, yeah. I, but I feel it on behalf of someone else. But that doesn't mean I get to go around screaming about it. I have to be the one to change the minds of my white friends and my white, you know, the white people who might listen to me, you know, right, hopefully. Right. It's like, that's a, that's a strange, um, that's a new dynamic to try to navigate, but to do it actively, I think is the work, you know? Um, Absolutely. I don't know, that and being proactive on a local level, it's important, you know? Yeah, and when we think it's hard or tiring to do that work, imagine being on the other side of it. I was just thinking that, and you know what I equate it to in some ways that it makes it easier for me to maybe understand what it's like. I mean, I imagine what would I feel if one of my family members died from COVID and some asshole was not wearing a mask and being a dick about it. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you feel it's personal. It's per like, and, and that's something that I can understand that anger, that right, just being so angry. And I feel it on behalf of other people when we talk about race issues like that, but it's not ultimately my understanding and my experience. I can't understand. Right. But what I can understand is what it feels like to, to watch someone you love get hurt in a way that is unfair and unjust and, and because of like horrible policy or like ignorance, like ignorance, like that, I, I see, you know, I can right. relate to that. Um, so I feel for it. I feel a lot of empathy and I, you have to find ways to channel it into good things you know, that make a difference. It's hard. Sorry, that was a rant, but no, that was, that was very well said, dude. Yeah. I haven't been able to talk about it either on like a live stream or talk about it, you know, in a way where it's like a face-to-face -face experience or person. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've written it out and I've tweeted it in short little bits, but at the end of the day, like that's the work, I think. You I know? should have asked that question like 38 minutes ago. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, it's good because I haven't either. And I was like, oh shit, this is the heavy question. I put and I some... asked it right up against the end. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. That's very well said. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, you know, I could say anything else. You know, I think we and all of the people in my life and community are trying to listen and learn and uh, just trying to hear people who want to be heard and need to be heard um, that I've, you know, shut out all these years, you know, and so trying to just like reverse that way of thinking and I can just try to be very conscious about like where I'm, uh, where I'm uh, listening to things or, or in, in making sure that I'm hearing, uh, you know, more perspectives than I usually do, you know, like it's just really important right now. And uh yeah so yeah well said Caleb. fuck yeah thanks and i just want to add one quick thing if that's okay yeah, yeah. is that i feel like it's really important to normalize saying that you weren't right i think a lot of people yeah. on social media want to be right all the time they want to land on the right side of history they want to be you know that's why you look at these movements and you go there's these huge like influx on social on social media with you know, posting about certain things and then it goes away and there's ebbs and flows and you don't ever, you, you want to be productive about it, but you also have to be aware of your own blind spots and it's okay to admit that they're there, you know, and that's how you grow and that's how you learn how to, and it's hard. It's learning is hard and, and admitting you're wrong is hard. And that's not something we're really taught a lot to do. <laughs> especially, right. you know, you want to be right. You want to get the good grades. You want to exceed, you want to be top of the class in all sorts of ways. But in this way, we have to it, look back and say, look at all these ways we were wrong. This is why we didn't know the truth. This is crazy. Look at this right. truth. You have to be looking for the truth all the time, you know, and understanding that. And that's what's so hard um, is admitting you're wrong. I've been wrong. We've all have blind spots. Oh, and sure. that needs to just be easier to talk about. Like we need to just see them, you know? Totally. But speaking yeah. of, I, when I started doing this, I said, I want to make sure that it's not just bearded white guys that I have on the show because there's so many other perspectives and uh, it's episode 13 and Kaylin, you're the first female that's been on the show. So oh, hi. Talk, talk about blind spots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, 
it's it's funny because I think it there are g- great like female female women you know there are, uh, of course in music um all sort there's so much diversity in music it's just you know it just needs to be elevated yeah you know, it's it's i played with guys my whole almost my whole life i was in one band i was in two bands with other uh women and that was cool but for the most part i spent my whole life in diy and diy was mostly dudes of course i don't know thinking back to the people that were in the punk rock scene when I was in high school, I think there was one uh, girl of like the 10 of us that were into punk rock. But sure. There was one girl. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. I mean, in high school, it was all for me, it was all guys uh, for the most part. I, I don't know when this is going to cut us off. It seems like we're over 40 minutes, but I want to make sure we're not in the middle of like a really important thing that we're talking about. So why don't we just kind of, okay wrap up here thank you very much sure. both of you for doing this this is uh really cool um, yeah thank you for having us yeah guys, thanks jason <laughs> if, if you're if whoever's still watching obviously i'll post this on youtube and igtv and all that stuff people should make sure that they check out both dating in the apocalypse and craigslist bed and action figures <laughs> hell yeah. yeah the first person that. i've ever talked to that's an action figure that's pretty awesome <laughs> that's uh, uh yeah, I'm I'm floored. But yeah, thank you for having us and thanks for letting us talk about some harder things. I hope I was articulate and kind of tried to do it justice, but it is complicated to navigate and thank you for you letting are, us talk and, about and, it. And maybe we'll do it again when I <laughs> when I extend yeah. more than forty minutes. <laughs> no, that's true. Thank you for having us. Thanks so yeah, thanks so much, Jason. <laughs> see nice you, to Jason. Meet you, Chris. Bye. Bye. Let's see if I do this right.